So despite the mixed reviews, I've been absolutely loving Code Vein for these last few days. And as you can probably tell by the amount of uploads after playing for countless hours, it's finally time for things I wish I knew earlier in Code Vein. So let's jump straight into it. Now the first thing, while it may not be the most important or game changing, it's one of the things that as soon as I realized it, it went on the list immediately. And it is the fact that you can deactivate the cinematic effect on the drain attacks. I know, I know they look amazing and they are spectacular the first few times you do them. But after playing for quite a few hours, it gets tedious to a point where I wasn't doing drain attacks just because I didn't want to watch the animation again and again. Pretty late at night, but I finally clicked and thought, okay, there's got to be an option to deactivate this. And turns out there is. If you go into the options menu, go into game settings, you can deactivate the cinematic effect on drain attacks. Now that we're on the topic of drain attacks, there's actually a pretty cool combat feature that doesn't really get mentioned. I'm sure it's in the tutorial somewhere, maybe at the start of the game. And I'm referring to the fact that there's another type of drain attack that isn't the backstab or parry. And we are talking about the R1X drain attack, and on Xbox I assume it would be R, B, and A. And we can't just do this right off the bat though, we have to do a light attack and then follow it up with the R1 and X combo. And this actually also counts as a drain attack to recover some Ica. Obviously we get less Ica this way than we would with a backstab or a parry because it requires less precision and skill to perform. But it can be executed very easily in combat and in fact it's actually a really useful thing to use in combat as it can often knock back enemies as well. Something else that doesn't really get explained in the game that's only going to really affect a certain type of players, as I'm sure many of you, such as myself, like exploring everything in these sort of games. I absolutely love the exploration aspects of Souls Likes in general, or just RPGs really, of making sure I'm picking up everything, I don't want to miss out on anything. And the problem with this is that you usually become very powerful very early game, not necessarily because of the items you're picking up, but more to do with the fact that while you're exploring you're going to kill every enemy in the game, probably even multiple times if you accidentally die, so you're going to find yourself excessively overleveled for early game. And the problem with this is that we'll end up in areas where we're killing enemies that are a lot lower level than us. And while killing enemies a lot lower level than us, it actually excessively slows down the rate of which we master the new gifts. And by this, I mean maxing out the gifts so that we're able to use that gift on other blood codes apart from the one it inherits from naturally. Which usually, if we're just playing through the game, you'll realize we learn them excessively quickly because we're always killing enemies at the same level or higher levels than us. However, if you ever try and go back and kill enemies a lot weaker than yourself, they take a long time to max out. Which really in late game isn't going to be so much of an issue because you have so much materials on haze that you can just afford to do this artificially by paying instead of naturally trying to unlock them. So it's definitely something you should take into account early game especially. And I'm sure very soon I'll be getting a video out of the best gifts you should definitely unlock as some of them are absolutely game changing. However, as a quick overview, just make sure that you're repairing all of the vestiges you pick up as soon as you possibly can. And you know for now it can be a pain because the loading screen to go back to the home base is excessively long and it really makes you not ever want to go back there, but this is really worth it. Specifically, the Mercury Blood Code has so many good abilities, it has Vivification, which counts as like a homeward bone, which allows you to go back to the previous missile without losing out on any of your haze. Which of course there are items that do the same, but having this in ability form is really, really useful. We have things to prevent and to heal venom and slow, there's so many good abilities in this. But the ones I would definitely focus on first are the passives, such as to get more strength, more dexterity, mastery with specific weapons, whichever weapon you're using. Definitely learn and max these ones out first, as the passives are good all across the board usually. And there's truly so many really, really good gifts that I'm trying my hardest not to make the entire video about this topic, so we'll save that for another day and let's move on. Now this may not be very useful to most people, but if you're a Soulsborne fan, there's one thing that you may have been missing, which are the gestures. Where are the gestures? Because if we go into the menu here, we can select to edit the gestures and select which gestures we want to do with which voice and which emote. However, as far as I can remember, the game never explained how to actually perform these gestures. And even if you're not playing multiplayer, I just love using gestures, whether it's to get screenshots or just look at the nice environments, I'm one of those people. And the way to use these is really not that intuitive, not something you just naturally do while playing the game what we have to do is click l3 twice or on xbox i would assume just the left analog stick click it down twice and this will allow you to access the gestures menu where we can select which one we want to use and the way i figured this out is something i don't regularly do in most games but on this one it's actually really useful as well and i'm referring to checking out the hints menu so if we go into the menu here we can check out some hints and while most of them, of course, are going to be things that are really obvious, like the health bar, the stamina bar, gifts, etc, etc, which you've probably naturally caught on to, but there's definitely some things in here, such as the gestures thing that I've learned a thing or two from. Especially when it comes to the stats, as stuff like strength, you'd assume it just increases physical damage, especially with heavy weapons. However, the strength stat also affects your health bar. Then we have dexterity, which of course affects physical attacks with more dexterity-based weapons, but it also affects the drain rating. 
Then we have Mind, which affects Stamina, Drain Speed, and Light Gifts. We have Willpower, that affects Elemental Assistances and Dark Gifts. Then we have Vitality, which also affects Health Points and Physical Damage Reduction. Then Fortitude also again affects Stamina and Elemental Assistance. So we can see that different stats sometimes affect the same sort of category. And again, if you're just starting out, you're probably not too fast in this, as you just level up everything at once, and you just kind of put any equipment on with any weapon that you like. When you get to late game and you're trying to make specific builds, or maybe on your new playthroughs, and you really want to make builds that are really personalized, you need to start taking into account what each and every stat does. Now before I mention this next one, I've seen the reviews, and I know everyone hates the fact that people keep comparing it to Dark Souls, but at the end of the day, gotta look out for my fellow Soulsborne players as well. And that is that in the Soulsborne game, if for example you infuse a weapon with lightning, let's say, that's it, that weapon is infused with lightning, and you're gonna be doing lightning damage. And then if you decide to infuse it with fire, you're gonna be doing fire damage instead. So it's easy to overlook the fact that in Code Vein, we can infuse with multiple elements at once. We can use the gift to infuse the weapon with fire and lightning at the same time. And while visually it may look like one overrides the other, we can easily confirm it by the amount of damage we do that it actually has both elements on at the same time. And for damage output, if you're trying to do some insane builds, this can be really, really useful against certain enemies. And in case you're wondering, this also works on weapons that you've transformed back at the base into, for example, lightning weapons through upgrades. You can also then afterwards infuse them with fire. And I, I've been using Lightning and Fire, but obviously this counts for stuff like Venom as well. Another question many people have, which I'm sure is already answered all over the internet and most likely in the game as well, is the fact that when you play multiplayer co-op with someone, if you are the guest, you automatically get reduced down to the same level as the host of the game. As well as obviously your healing items get decreased as well. Like I mentioned before, now because I explore throughout the every area in depth, I never really had any reason to come back to areas later on after I'd already finished them. But in Code Vein, you definitely want to return every now and then to the previous areas, as often new NPC characters will show up in these completed areas. Most of them offer a new side quest, and while we're not going to go into which side quests give you which rewards right now, there's one specific one I would definitely like to point out, which is the one that appears back at the first boss arena where we fought Oliver Collins just after the tutorial. It's because this NPC actually sells us valuable items, which we can use to gain exchange and trade points with our companions back at the base if we want any of their weapons or items. But the problem is, at the start, his selection of items aren't really too spectacular. Most of them are pretty trashy and don't give us many trade points with any of the companions. But something I realized thanks to one of the comments on our Onibade video is that somebody mentioned that when you finish his side quest, which literally takes you less than a minute, he gives you a map, you have to go down into one of the depth and get the certain item, come back. After completing that side quest, he'll actually sell some more and pretty useful valuable items, such as the sake, which you can give to Yakumo for 5 trade points each, which really speed things up if you're trying to get the Onibane. Now this next thing I already mentioned on a whole separate video, and I'm sure most of you already know this, but remember you can play the game solo without any NPC companion if you wish to, by simply going back in the home base, talking to whichever companion you have at that current time, and just ask him to stop following you, and that way you can play the game completely solo with no companion, no co-op help, and to be honest it really makes the game a lot more challenging and a lot more interesting which will also help you to actually learn the boss fights instead of just taking hits, getting revived by your teammate, letting him do 90% of the work, and then going on Reddit complaining the game is too easy. And for the final tip that I would consider kind of important, but at the same time it's very, very slight spoiler, I suppose, uh, but if you're interested in the endings in any way, I would definitely recommend sticking around for this final one. As personally, I probably wouldn't even really consider it a spoiler, uh, but what I'm referring to is the fact that when you get to the part of the game where you have to defeat the successors, this is where you really have to start making choices of which ending you want to get. As to get the happy, let's say the good ending, which, what you need to do is you need to make sure you're repairing all of the parts of that vestige before you fight that boss. So for example, in the snowy area, before you fight the boss of that area, make sure you've collected and repaired all of the Fion vestiges. As this is the only way to save the successor after the boss fight, if you don't have them already repaired by then, Again, I mean actually repairing the vestiges, watching the memories, not just collecting them. But I don't want to go too in-depth on the whole endings. A, I'll do a separate video on that, but B, mainly because I want to keep this as spoiler-free as possible after the Sekiro incident. So anyway, guys, those are the things I wish I knew earlier and tips for Code Vein. If you have any more tips, as always, I am very much encouraging you to leave them in the comments down below for myself and for other players starting out on the game. So I hope you did find this very helpful. If you did, don't forget that thumbs up button, subscribe for more content coming very soon, and we'll see you next time.